Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wild Neighbor Speaker Series. We're very happy to have you here today. Um, this webinar is a collaboration with Travis County and the City of Austin, who co-manages the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, along with a number of other public and private partners. Um, before we get started, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Jeremy Hull, and I'm the Community Liaison for Travis County Natural Resources. Today, we're very lucky to have Dr. Benjamin Hutchins here to talk about uh, groundwater fauna with us. Uh, ben is a re researcher and educator in the Edwards Aquifer Research and Data Center at Texas State University. His research focuses on the distribution of groundwater species in Texas and patterns of biodiversity in subterranean habitats. He received his PhD from Texas State University and previously worked as the state invertebrate biologist at the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, his presentation today is going to provide an overview of all the unusual organisms that live in the dark underground waters of the Lone Star State, with special attention to the area around Austin. At the end of the presentation, Jaya Torres with the City of Austin will manage our Q&A session. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the Q&A box and not the chat, and we will get to as many of those as possible at the end. There is a recording of this webinar being made and it will be posted to our Facebook and YouTube pages to be used as a future resource. And on that note, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over. So uh, thanks, Jeremy, for the introduction. Uh, thanks everybody for joining in today. Um, I'm super excited about this. It's one of my uh, favorite topics of discussion. Uh, and I hope to just uh, convince all of you all how interesting and unusual the animals are that uh, live in groundwater habitats. You can see uh, a few of our uh, Texas groundwater species here on the, my title page. Uh, with the exception of the big crayfish down at the bottom, uh, all of these are groundwater obligate species. That means they only live underground. They cannot survive in surface water. Uh, and so they have cool adaptations and, and cool ecology most of them are blind and without pigment. And, and so we're just going to do like a whirlwind overview of, of, these, of these animals. Okay, so giving you an outline of the talk, I want to spend some time at the beginning uh, just giving an overview of the different kinds of groundwater habitats. Right, we think about groundwater as a habitat. It's actually a bunch of different kinds of habitats. And then we'll talk about the animals that live in those habitats. So animals that are restricted to groundwater, right, they can't survive in surface water, those are called stigobionts or stigobites, all right? And so we're gonna go over uh, what those animals, what kinds of animals we find in the habitat and, and patterns of diversity. Where do we find lots of these species? Uh, where do we not find them and, and why is that? And then I wanna spend a little time talking about food webs in groundwater. It uh, seems like kind of a strange topic, but uh, it's actually a really interesting and fascinating part of the ecology of groundwater habitats. And then I'll end uh, with some of our most recent work talking about the ecology uh, of the Barton Springs segment of the Edwards Aquifer and uh, some of the new species that we're finding up there and elsewhere. Uh, what do we do when we find a new species and, and why is that important? All right, so let's talk about groundwater habitats. So, so, so here in Central Texas, uh, we're most familiar with uh, karst aquifers and karst habitats, right? So karst is a landscape that has geographic features um, that formed through the dissolution or the dissolving of the bedrock. So things like caves and sinkholes. And in terms of groundwater habitats in karst, uh, we can kind of divide that into two different sections, the phreatic zone and the vados zone. So the vados zone is everything above the groundwater table. So we have air-filled spaces, right? And so some of the groundwater habitats we might see in the vados zone are cave streams or perched pools. Something that's not shown in this diagram, one of the uh, shallowest features in uh, the Beto zone is called epikarst. This is sometimes called the skin of karst. All right, it occurs kind of at the interface between surface soil and um, the deeper kind of cave conduits. And so it's an area where we have a lot of dissolution, a lot of little spaces 
vertical and horizontal uh, fractures and dissolution features. There can be a lot of water storage in there and a lot of water movement as well, uh, but we can't really get to it. It's too small for people, but we can sample it indirectly by going into a cave and putting a drip tarp or a collection bucket underneath of stalactites. And when water drips out, little animals can drip out as well. We've only done this uh, just a tiny bit in Texas, so we haven't found much and really don't know much about the epicarst fauna here in Texas. Um, but we know that in other parts of the world, the epicarst can contain a diverse fauna. Uh, and in Brazil, apparently, there's even a, a groundwater adapted catfish that comes out of their stalactites. So um, maybe somebody will find a, a Texas catfish coming out of a stalactite one day. Uh, as we move deeper, uh, eventually that water moves down and hits the groundwater table and moves into the phreatic zone. So that's, this is everything below the water table, right? There aren't any air-filled spaces in the phreatic zone. But again, there can be multiple types of habitats there, right? So we could have conduits that are big enough for, for scuba divers to swim through. We could have deep pools. Uh, we could also have more uh, shallow um, voids along bedding planes and vertical faults and fractures. And eventually that water may flow out at a spring. And so the spring is an interesting groundwater habitat. It's what we call an ecotone or a transition between two habitats, between the groundwater habitat and the surface water. And so we can find animals that are adapted to living just right at the spring. And we can also sample springs and get animals that are coming from deeper in the aquifer and getting washed out. Uh, we also have uh, many non-karstic groundwater habitats, right? So if we think about um, places like the Llano Uplift or uh, some of our mountains in West Texas, like the Davis Mountains or the Chisos Mountains, we can get granites and basalts, uh, metamorphic rocks, and we can have fractures and water-filled spaces in those types of rocks as well. And we know from places in Europe and elsewhere that there can be uh, groundwater animals that are living in those kind of rocks. Um, but this is, a, this is a habitat that is uh, basically completely unknown or unsampled here in Texas. Uh, we can have animals that live in sand and gravel aquifers. So long as there's enough oxygen and uh, so long as the pore spaces are big enough that little animals can wriggle through, um, we could have animals there. One of my favorite groundwater habitats that does not occur in karst, well, it can occur in karst, but it can occur off of karst as well, are the water-filled spaces below and adjacent to surface streams. And so that's a shallow groundwater habitat called the hyperreic zone. And so this is a zone where surface water in that stream might be sinking down, or we might have deeper groundwater coming up into the stream. It's a zone where you have groundwater and surface water mixing. And we can sample that by hammering in a big spike and using what's called a burouse pump to suck water out of the hyperreic zone and suck animals out as well. And this is really nice um, because I can park at a stream at a road crossing and I can walk up and down the stream and sample the hyperreic zone as much as I like. It's relatively accessible compared to other groundwater habitats. You know, if I want to sample um, the animals that are living a thousand feet down in the Edwards Aquifer in Bear County, that's, that's not an easy task, right? I either have to find a borehole or, or drill one at great expense, right? So the hyperreic zone is really accessible. And particularly in karst areas where our streams are fed by karstic groundwater, so areas like um, the San Marcos River or parts of the Guadalupe River, um, the hyperreic zone can kind of serve as an extension of that aquifer habitat. And so we actually can find in the hyperreic zone the same species that we find deeper in caves and, and, and some of our karst features, such as along the Balcones Escarpment or in the hill country. All right, an even shallower groundwater habitat is something called the hypotelmineric zone. Uh, that's just a big fancy way of saying a seep coming out of soil, right? So this is different than some of our seepage springs that are coming out of bedrock that we find in places like the hill country. This is groundwater that is in soil and not in bedrock. And so the idea here, if you look at this diagram, is that you have an impermeable layer, like a clay layer, and rainwater seeps down and gets perched 
on top of that clay because it can't really percolate through easy. And then anywhere that the land surface is low enough, that shallow groundwater that may only be a meter deep is expressed at the surface in these tiny little seeps or wet puddles. They can be very small, very little flow. They can dry up seasonally. But when they're flowing, if you sort through the leaves and the rocks, you can find the same kinds of animals that you would expect to see in other groundwater habitats like cave streams or wells. Um, we would expect this kind of habitat uh, in areas where we have more rain and where we have deeper soils, so maybe in, in East Texas. But again, um, this is a, a groundwater habitat that is almost completely unsampled in Texas. So you, you see a, a theme emerging here with all of these types of habitats that we haven't even looked at yet. Uh, there are even marine and coastal groundwater habitats. And um, it, the same applies here, right? Texas has a lot of coast. And uh, there's no reason that baby hazel couldn't be sitting on top of some groundwater animals that are living down in the sand grains there. Um, we know that animals live in that habitat. Uh, we have sampled subterranean organisms on the coast in other places, uh, but we haven't looked at that in Texas yet. Okay, so that was your whirlwind tour of the different kinds of, of habitats in which stigobites or stigobionts might occur. And so now let's look at the animals themselves. All right, so here are uh, 10 more Texas groundwater invertebrates, Texas stigobionts, right? And we can see uh, that they have some similarities. They're oftentimes blind, they lack pigment, Right? These are adaptations to the subterranean environment. Uh, they can have physiologic and behavioral adaptations that we're not really going to talk about today. But I want to give you an idea of what you might find if you look closely in these habitats. And one of the ways that I like to do that is by comparing the animals that we have in groundwater here in Texas with those that are in France. Uh, I do this because Texas and France are, are roughly comparable in size. And they have roughly similar amounts of karst or limestone. But the French have been looking at groundwater animals for 100 years longer than we have. So they're, they're way ahead of us in some ways. But we can compare these faunas and, and make some generalizations about the kinds of animals that live in groundwater. So one thing that you don't see a lot of in groundwater are insects. So if I go out to a surface stream, like the San Marcos River out my window here, uh, we find a lot of insects, right? Uh, mayfly larvae and dragonfly larvae. But in groundwater, really the only insects that we find are subterranean beetles. Uh, and we actually have eight species of subterranean aquatic beetles in Texas. They belong to three different families. So that's actually uh, really high beetle diversity. Uh, France has a couple of, of aquatic diving beetles as well. And we see that around the world. Beetles are really the only insect that gets underground in, in in aquatic environments. Um, we also generally don't see very many vertebrate species living in groundwater, right? We go out to that stream and we see all these different fish species. Um, but in subterranean environments, the idea is that one, there may not be enough food to support those big active vertebrate species. And two, um, a lot of them are visual predators and, and they're just not really well adapted to be mo to moving into that dark environment. But here in Texas, we do actually have three species of groundwater catfish and three species of salamander that I consider to be fully subterranean. And so six vertebrate species is actually wildly good. Um, France doesn't have any. And in fact, in all of Europe, there's only one groundwater vertebrate species, um, but it is a pretty spectacular animal. And we'll, we'll see a picture of that in a minute. Uh, China is probably the, the global epicenter of groundwater vertebrate diversity. They've got tons and tons of subterranean fish and they're finding more and more every time they look. So instead of insects and vertebrates, what we see in groundwater are a lot of crustaceans, right? So here in Texas, our community is dominated by crustaceans over half of our species. These are the pods, as I call them. So like isopods and ostracods, copepods, uh, and other uh, unusual crustaceans. We see that same pattern in Europe, right, where the crustaceans are really the important part of our groundwater fauna. Aside from crustaceans, we also have soft-bodied animals like flatworms, oligochaetes, annelids, 
uh, we actually have a subterranean leech here in Texas, and snails. Right, so snails are an important part of our fauna, and we actually have some really cool looking snails uh, like Phreatodrobia coronae here. France actually has 81 species of subterranean snails, so really high snail diversity. And that's from a 2007 paper, so they probably have more now. But there are also some animals that only occur in groundwater and that we would never expect to find in surface water. And so these are some really cool and really unusual animals. Probably the best example are the remipedes. So the remipedes are an entire order of very ancient, very primitive crustacean. You can only find these in groundwater habitats. And so to put that in perspective, all of the mammals in the world, from humans to bats to whales, belong to a single order, mammalia, right? And so here's a single order as different from all other animals as mammals are from all other animals. And you can only find it by going underground. Uh, these other three species, uh, these other three groups, the Spileogryphaceans, Stygiomycids, and Thermospinaceans, those are classes of crustaceans. Um, so a, an example of, of, of a class of animals, all bats belong to the class Chiroptera. Uh, carnivora are the, the cats and the dogs and, and other carnivores, right? So these are not very, there aren't a lot of species in these groundwater groups, but they represent very ancient, very unique, isolated branches of the tree of life that you can only find by going underground. That makes groundwater a great place to study uh, the evolution of life. Uh, we have one of these, the Thermos Benacean here in Texas. All right, so where else do these animals occur? All right, so this is a map of the most biodiverse subterranean sites in the world uh, as of 2021. You can ignore the black dots. Those are our caves that are have a diverse assemblage of terrestrial species like spiders and millipedes. We're not gonna talk about those. We're interested in the blue dots, which are the diverse groundwater sites. And you can see that most of them are clustered in uh, this line called the Mid-Latitude Ridge of Biodiversity. And then we've got one outlier down here in Western Australia. Uh, if I give this talk again in 10 years, there will probably be a bunch more dots in Western Australia. It's emerging as a hot spot of, of pretty uh, wild subterranean biodiversity. There will probably some, be some down in Brazil as well. And so there may be kind of a southern mid-latitude ridge of biodiversity that we don't know about yet. But most of them are in the northern hemisphere, and the numbers that you see are the number of species in the five most biodiverse groundwater sites on Earth. And so the most diverse site is the Pastoina cave system in Slovenia with 72 species. Uh, but the point here to notice is that number three on this list is the San Marcos Artesian Well right here in Texas in the Edwards Aquifer. Right, so this should be a point of Texas pride that uh, we've got, we win the bronze, right? We're the third most biodiverse site on earth and we're still finding more species all the time. So uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in is what drives this diversity? Why are some sites species rich and others species poor? And um, there are a lot of different reasons for that. It depends on where you are in the world, but we can kind of, lump those factors into three broad categories, and those are the history of a place, how much energy is available to support those animals, and habitat diversity or, or habitat heterogeneity, how many different kinds of habitats are in an area to support animals living in different ways. So let's look at uh, some examples. All right, history. So here is a map of the world during the late Cretaceous. Uh, what you're seeing is the breakup of Pangaea and the death of an ocean, right? So when all of the land masses were kind of lumped together, they kind of circled around this ocean called the Tethys Ocean. And at this time in the Cretaceous, they're breaking apart. Africa and India are moving across the Tethys Ocean, which will soon cease to be. But you can see that the shoreline of the Tethys Ocean kind of comes through North Africa and modern day Mediterranean, uh, what will be the Atlantic and the Caribbean and down through Western Australia. This is significant 
because there are groups of animals like our cirrolanid isopods, our thermospinaceans, and our hadzeid amphipods. And if you look at where these animals occur now, we find them in places like uh, in groundwater, in places like the Caribbean and the Mediterranean and North Africa and Australia. So places that are widely separated now have these related species. And what we're seeing is the the echo or the fingerprint of the Tethys Ocean, right? We call this a Tethian distribution uh, because the ancestors of these species lived in the shallow coastal waters of the Tethys Ocean. And then as that sea receded, those animals get stranded and adapted to freshwater and have moved into groundwater now. So they move into that groundwater and they have to eat. And it turns out that um, the amount of energy available, the amount of food available, is really important for thinking about what sites do and don't have a lot of species. So again, we can see here in Europe, the mid-latitude ridge of biodiversity. And as you move north from that, right, Europe gets colder, you get a history of glaciation, uh, and biodiversity goes down. It's less productive. There's less photosynthesis going on at the surface. Um, and that's what we see with the, the, colored, the, the color of these uh, polygons, right? The black sites are the most diverse, followed by the gray, and then the white sites are the least diverse. And as you move south from that mid-latitude ridge, it gets warmer, but it also gets drier, right? So places like Greece and Spain are drier, less primary productivity on the surface. And that means less organic matter that gets washed into the groundwater system. And so less organic matter, less energy available to support those groundwater communities. Now, uh, interestingly, and we'll talk about this more later, there are some sites like Movila Cave, shown in this picture, in Romania, uh, where the groundwater community is not dependent on organic matter washing in from the surface. Rather, uh, in places like Movila, you have microbes, and those microbes are using chemical energy, energy from chemical reactions to make their own food. And those microbes then are the base of the food web. So this is life without light, life without energy coming from the sun. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, so the last of those categories was habitat diversity or habitat heterogeneity, right? So if your groundwater habitat is a cave stream, say, and it could be a long cave stream, maybe that cave stream goes for miles, but it's all just a cave stream. Well, it makes sense. The only animals you're gonna find there are animals that are adapted to live in cave streams. But now, if that cave stream then plunges over a waterfall into a deep pool, and there's a submerged conduit that goes down into the phreatic zone, and that water comes out at a spring, and that spring supports a hyperreic community, now we've got all these different kinds of habitats, and that supports a greater number of species because those species are occupying different niches, right? They're, they're and they have different ecologies. They make living. They they make their living in different ways. And so, uh, in 2015, a researcher named David M. Uh, showed this really nicely, looking at uh, groundwater crustaceans in uh, Europe. And what he found, if you look at this figure on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left here, species richness on the y-axis is highest in areas that had a big range of elevation. So not high elevation, but a lot of topographic relief, high spots and low spots, valleys and mountains. And also these sites had the highest habitat diversity, so different kinds of groundwater habitats, right? So habitat heterogeneity, the number of different types of habitats is positively correlated with the number of species that you can find in a place. And um, David Culver showed this in the Eastern US as well with a simpler analysis. Uh, they just found that if you look at the number of caves in a place, turns out that's a really good predictor of how many species are there. And the idea here is that more caves mean more different kinds of caves and more different kinds of subterranean habitats. So, so what does this mean for Texas? Right. Um, so the map on the left here is about five years out of date, but as of 2018, this shows uh, all of the sites in Texas where we have a record of one or more groundwater obligate species. Uh, we have a bunch more in West Texas now. But what you see is that they're really clustered here around the Edwards Aquifer. That's kind of our 
epicenter, our hot spot of diversity. And that's because all of those different factors come together to support high species richness in the Edwards. So let's think about that. Right, we already talked about history, uh, that this area was inundated by shallow seas in the Cretaceous through probably the Eocene. And so we get colonization of animals from the marine environment, in addition to animals that are moving in from surface streams, right? We have animals of freshwater and marine, and marine origin living in our groundwater today. All right, what about energy? Uh, well, uh, here's a map of the Edwards, and you can see that a lot of our most diverse groundwater sites, this is a map of all of the sites that we know of with 10 or more groundwater species. Many of those are clustered along that kind of southern and eastern border of the Edwards Aquifer. Now, if you know your hydrology, that's an area sometimes called the bad water line or the freshwater saline water interface. You've got saline water and freshwater coming together and where they mix, you have microbes that are using that chemical energy to make their own food, just like we saw in that Movila cave system, right? We have that going on here. So we have a con constant and, and dependable energy source supporting high diversity. And then the last one was habitat diversity or habitat heterogeneity. Well, that's an easy one. The Edwards is a big, deep, and complex aquifer, right? We've got wells that are some of the deepest stigabyte sites on the planet, right? Some of the deepest places where we have found groundwater animals are wells in Bear County. But we also have shallow sites like Barton Springs and, and Comal Springs. Um, we have caves, we have wells, we have springs, we have complex hydrology, complex faulting, right? We have different water chemistry. So we have a lot of diversity of different habitats supporting the high diversity that we see in the Edwards and in central Texas. Uh, for you Travis County folks, just FYI, the numbers here are the number of species recorded at that site. Uh, this is also out of date. So we'll, we'll provide you all with some updates later on. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit more about energy and what these animals are eating, okay? So in a lot of sites where we don't have those chemoautotrophic microbes making their own food, animals in groundwater are dependent on food from the surface, right? If you've ever been in a cave, you'll know that it's pretty dark. We don't see a lot of plants growing in caves. We don't see algae. Well, plants and algae are the base of most of our aquatic food webs on the surface. Uh, but groundwater habitats are dependent on what we call allochthonous organic matter. That just means it's coming from outside of the system. It's not being produced in the groundwater itself, but in places where we have recharge, right? Like Onion Creek, water flows from the surface into the aquifer, and all the organic matter that's in that water, whether it's a plant material or algae or, you know, um, phytoplankton, it could be a water burger that somebody dropped into the stream. It's all getting washed into the aquifer there. Uh, that supports microbes. It gets converted into dissolved organic matter and it supports microbial biofilms. And those uh, heterotrophic microbes are the base of the food web. Heterotrophic just means they're not making their own energy. They're just eating other food and then the microbes then are eaten by the animals. So that's what's going on in a lot of groundwater habitats. Um, and animals have some uh, good adaptations because in that kind of system, you never know when your next meal is gonna come and you never know where it's gonna be. So it's spatially and temporally unreliable. And so animals are adapted to deal with that. So uh, this long uh, salamander here is the European cave salamander. Uh, Proteus uh, has been studied uh, quite a bit in terms of its metabolism and adaptations. Researchers have shown that it can go eight years without food and without showing any uh, detrimental effects from starvation. It does that by having extremely uh, low metabolic requirements. Uh, it has slow metabolism. It lives for a really long time, low reproductive rate. And it has these energy saving strategies like just sitting on a rock for months or years at a time without moving. Uh, they've been shown to do that. Most of these animals are also opportunists. They'll eat whatever they can find uh, whenever they can get it, like these cerulanid isopods that are eating a, a cave cricket that fell into their pool. So I had an uh, entomology professor that said that we should all be very thankful that 
we are the big guys because um, we would definitely be on the menu if 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 these uh, invertebrates were a little bit bigger. So I've already alluded to this idea that in some groundwater systems, the animals are not dependent on organic matter from the surface, and you have those microbes. Those microbes are doing something called chemolithoautotrophy. All right, so that's a, a long word, but it's not any longer than the stuff that you all eat if you look on the back of your food packages. And we can translate that roughly to mean that these microbes are chemically fueled, self-feeding rock eaters. Um, so what I mean here is that by rock, they're getting their carbon from inorganic sources, right? So like plants get their carbon from carbon dioxide. These microbes are getting their carbon either by eating the, the rock di directly, like uh, the rock eater here, or they're assimilating uh, dissolved carbon that's already in the water, like CO2 or carbonate. And they're getting the energy to do this from uh, inorganic chemicals, right? So they might be uh, utilizing uh, sulfide or ammonia. And um, this sounds kind of interesting. Sounds kind of weird. It's life without light, right? Not energy from the sun. But you've probably heard of this before if, you've, uh, if you know about hydrothermal vents or methane seeps in the deep ocean. It's the same process going on here, right? Here you have this hot, reduced um, water coming, uh, thermal water coming out. It's got a lot of dissolved solids where it mixes with the cold, oxygenated seawater. You have what's called a redox gradient. You have oxidized and reduced um, chemical compounds, and uh, microbes are able to use that redox gradient to generate energy to fix carbon, and they support this whole uh, rich ecosystem. And that's going on here in the Edwards Aquifer as well. This video in, in, in the lower uh, right here, all that white stuff floating around, all those long strands on the on the walls of that bore, those are the microbes uh, that are that are chemoautotrophic, right? So that's the food source for a lot of our animals, at least in parts of the Edwards, not everywhere, but along the freshwater saline water interface, where those different kinds of waters mix together and and set up that redox gradient. So I want to build on that a little bit, that idea of, of food webs and where their food is coming from, and share with you all some of our most recent work in the Barton Spring segment of the Edwards Aquifer. And when I finish up talking about those food webs, we'll touch on some of the new species that we are finding and what do we do when we find them. So uh, our work in, in Barton Springs was funded by the city of Austin, and it was really focused on our federally listed salamanders, uh, Eurecia sasorum and uh, Eurecia waterluensis. And we went through and we sampled a bunch of places in uh, the Barton Springs segment of the aquifer, and we conducted an analysis called a stable isotope analysis. All right, and so here are the results of a stable isotope analysis. Um, so, so let me walk you through what these charts show. So if you look at the chart on the left here, this is from some earlier work that we did in the San Antonio segment. And what you start looking at, what you want to focus on are these crosshairs. This one that's labeled COM, this stands for chemoautotrophic organic matter, right? So this is these are those microbes that are that are making their own food. POM stands for photosynthetic organic matter, right? So this is plant matter washing in from the surface. So animals that are eating plant matter would have a similar carbon isotope composition. And so they would fall out above that plant matter. Animals that are eating microbes, you would expect to fall out above that microbial signature. And that's what we see in the San Marcos artesian well. These polygons represent different species. And so what we can see is some of those species clearly fall out vertically above that chemoautotrophic signal. That's what they're eating. Their carbon isotope values here on the x-axis are way too negative uh, and that suggests that they're not eating photosynthetic organic matter. But if you compare that to what we see in Eliza Springs and some of the other springs in Barton Springs, these numbers aren't that negative, right? They're over in the 30s. And so they fall out kind of along that photosynthetic signal. And so that suggests to us that these guys are really more dependent on photosynthetic organic matter, plant matter coming in from the surface. Um, 
there are a couple of reasons that might be why, why there are differences in these areas. Um, and it could be that microbial processes, that um, chemoautotrophy is still important in the Barton Springs segment. Um, but if it turns out that it is really plant matter that's supporting this food web, that has some pretty significant implications for the conservation of these species, because it means that they're potentially even more sensitive to climate change and uh, to increased impervious cover. Because both climate change and impervious cover is going to alter how much plant matter and how much organic matter from the surface gets in and is available to these animals, right? If our rains become less depend less dependable and drought becomes more frequent, that means less food going into the aquifer. And if we continue to pave over parts of our recharge zone, reducing the amount of water that comes in, we're not only reducing water quality and water quantity, we're also reducing the amount of food available for these species. So there's some more work to be done here, but it's an interesting result comparing these different segments of the aquifer. Uh, we also found um, several species new to uh, the Barton Springs segment or to Barton Springs. So four of these species were already described species. So these are species that we knew about. We just didn't know that they were at Barton Springs, which is surprising, right? You would think that Barton Springs, right in the middle of Austin, right next to a university, would have been sampled and sampled very extensively. Um, but we still find new species almost everywhere we look. Uh, and some of these species are actually undescribed species. So we have at least three to three species uh, that are new to science. Um, we have two of those here, the, this ostracod and this engulfiella. Um, so this is cool, not only because it shows that Barton Springs is actually one of our uh, diverse sites in Texas, um, but it also means we've got new species. And in some ways, that's not actually a huge surprise because we've been finding new species in Texas for over 100 years. And the rate at which we're describing species over time is actually increasing. We're describing new species in Texas faster now than ever before. Uh, a few of the species on, these, on this list are species that were already known, but only recently discovered in Texas. Uh, the Mexican blind cat is like the coolest example of that ever. Uh, this was only found a few years ago, and it's not every day that you can say that you add a new fish to a, a state fauna, let alone a subterranean fish. But most of these are, um, most of this increase in the number of described species is us going out and finding and describing those species. Uh, and just to give a little plug for the Edwards Aquifer Research and Data Center, where I work, of the 100 or so species that we now have described, 43 of those, uh, so over a third, had an EARDC staff member involved in the description of that species. Uh, and 25 of those species, so almost a quarter of our Texas groundwater invertebrates, had a, um, had an EARDC staff person involved in the description since 2015, right? So we've been really busy. And it's important um, because we have a lot of work to do. Again, comparing uh, what's known in Texas to France, right? They've, they have the same pattern, right? Where the rate of increase, whoops, they're describing more and more species faster and faster. Uh, you know, so France, which should have a comparable number of species given the size of, of the country, has like almost four times as many species described. So any proud Texan should be uh, outraged and indignant at this, um, this injustice. We need to catch up. Uh, the problem is that it takes a long time to describe a species. And so I kind of want to go over what that, what that looks like. So it starts by uh, going out in the field and collecting uh, samples. So here you can see a, a net on a spring, on a Comal spring. That sample has a bunch of animals in it, and it has a bunch of other uh, schmutz in it, right? It can have sand and mud and rocks and leaves and sticks. So we got to get somebody to sort through it. So here at the uh, Edwards Aquifer Research and Data Center, we have about a dozen people that, that do this. Uh, I estimate that we spend about 70 person hours a week just processing these field samples. And so then you wind up with a little sample of an animal of interest. And if you think it might be new, you've got to send it to an expert. Sometimes that expert is us, but more often than not, we have to send it somewhere else. Uh, so we send samples all around the world. We have partners in Canada and Turkey and Spain uh, and other states here in the U.S. 
if they determine that it's new, oftentimes they'll need more samples. So we have to start over again and go back out to the field and collect more samples. Once they get enough samples, they then dissect those animals. They draw all the body parts and describe them verbally. And nowadays, uh, most taxonomy has additional work, right? So we may use uh, methods like scanning electron microscopy to zoom in and image uh, really tiny body parts. It's becoming standard to use molecular methods uh, to know where these animals fit on the tree of life uh, using genetics. And we'll, we increasingly use statistical analyses. So instead of just qualitatively saying that species A is different from species B because of some uh, feature, we can actually measure body parts and compare them statistically to say that, uh, yeah, indeed, these are different. Uh, all of those data get compiled into a publication. That publication goes out for review and other taxonomists look at it and point out issues or ask questions and we have to revise it. Sometimes we have to revise it again and again. Uh, it can take a year or more and eventually we have a publication. Oftentimes that publication doesn't come out uh, for years or decades after that original field collection was made. And only after the publication was uh, only after that publication happens, then finally we can go back to that original sample that was collected years and years ago, give it a name, and curate that, catalog it, put it on a shelf, and make those data available to other researchers. So it takes a long time, but it's important, right? So I like to say that uh, this work is, is exploration, right? We're documenting the natural world and sharing our discoveries. But practically, uh, this is really valuable because uh, most of our framework in the United States for protection of animals is protection for described species, right? We have the Endangered Species Act, not the Endangered Undescribed Species Act. Uh, here in Texas, we get a lot of our conservation work from Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, because they're interested in, in what they have identified as species of greatest conservation need. It's not undescribed species of greatest conservation need. And then uh, from an academic perspective, species are the basic unit of measurement, uh, the basis of, of many of our ecologic and evolutionary studies. If I want to understand why one spot has a lot of species and another doesn't, well, I can't answer that question if I don't know what species are there to begin with. Uh, I could go on and on about why this is important. These animals may provide ecosystem services. Uh, they may be important for medical studies. We may not know their importance yet. Um, but we don't want to wait until they're already gone before we discover that, right? If you think about the Edwards Aquifer, industrial use, municipal use, agricultural use, recreational use, it's worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. And these animals can play a role in that ecosystem, even if it's a tiny role, right? You're not going to ignore the screw uh, in the space station, right? Even if it's a little screw, uh, right? So these animals can be really important. And there's a lot of work to do. Right, so this page uh, shows you nine different groundwater species here in Texas. Uh, none of them have names. None of them have names. They're all undescribed species. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get funding to describe species, right? We get funding to do ecological studies, uh, evolutionary studies, um, but there's not a lot of funding out there for good old fashioned taxonomy. Um, so if there are any uh, wealthy patrons listening uh, that wants to support taxonomy, now you know who to talk to. Um, all right, so now I'm finishing up here. Uh, I want to thank a bunch of folks. So here at the Edwards Aquifer Research and Data Center, we've got lots of uh, faculty and staff, graduate students and undergrads, sorting our samples, doing cool analyses. Uh, at, in Texas State, uh, Chase Corrington, uh, he's actually at TPWD now. Chase and Weston uh, did a lot of the isotope analyses at Barton Springs. Uh, Annette and Hannah and Audrey at UT Knoxville uh, did all, all of our microbial work is coming out of, of Annette's lab. And then we've got a lot of taxonomists all over the place that are helping us out understanding what species we have. So uh, that's the end of my, my presentation. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it and I hope that I have plenty of time for any questions that you might have. All right, thanks so much, Ben. That was great, uh, great presentation. We have a couple questions in Q&A. So first question, can you please talk about any eDNA work that you do? I'll talk about all the eDNA work that I do because I don't really do it. Um, 
we have some partners that do eDNA work. Um, and so for those of you all who don't know, uh, eDNA is a really promising method where we can take a water sample and look for DNA in that water sample to figure out what animals are living there, even if we don't get the animals themselves, right? We fluff, um, we slough cells off of our off of our skin. These animals will secrete mucus or uh, excrete waste, and there's DNA there. You can use eDNA to see what those animals are. Most of our animals uh, in Texas, we have not characterized uh, genetically, um, and so that eDNA, especially for these little invertebrates. Um, we could probably tell, okay, there are amphipods here or there are isopods here. We can't get down to the species level yet. Uh, that is not something that our lab is doing, but I know that there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, the San Antonio Zoo uh, has some work doing that. Uh, TPWD and others have had some interest in that as well. Um, so keep an eye out for that. It'll be a growing uh, method for sure. All right, next question. Um, do you know if anyone has looked at the abundance of those photosynthetic or plant-eating groundwater species in relation to maturity of vegetation in the local area? Oh man, that's a really cool question. Uh, I don't I don't know of anybody that has done that. Um, that sounds like a, a perfect master's master's thesis waiting to happen. Uh, we do know that with changes in, in vegetative communities, we can see changes in food web structure, but I don't know of any anything like that that's been done in Texas. Okay, yeah, because in this question, um, they mentioned that they've heard the jolly bull plateau salamanders are more abundant in old growth forests, and just curious if it's been observed or documented for other species. Uh, no, I, not that I'm aware, but that's, it's a super interesting question. All right, next question. Does the Dumbo ostracod appear to be the same one that was found at Mormon Spring number three with uh, quote pectoral fins? I think I, I think I can guess who that who that question came from. I think so. Uh, we think it's the same thing, but don't quote me on that. All right, great. Um, next question. What are critical threats to groundwater fauna other than climate change and impervious cover? Yeah, so big threats to groundwater fauna. Uh, it's all about water quantity and water quality, right? So we know that that we're extracting water. Uh, some of these animals are spring adapted species, right? They're not found deeper in the aquifer. They're, aquifer. they're found at the spring, right? So if we're drawing water down in, in the aquifer and that spring is drying up, and boy, I could tell you some stories about springs drying up recently. Um, right, the animals that are living at that spring opening don't have anywhere to go. They can't move deeper into the aquifer. They can't move out into the surface stream. So water quantity, water quality is is the biggest factor is is protecting our our water resources, just maintaining water levels. You know. Great. And then next question, what kind of steps do you take to disinfect, so to speak, before you enter a sensitive system in the subterranean to do field work? <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's actually a really good question. Um, we do uh, try to disinfect. We don't want to accidentally um, we don't want to accidentally introduce species or introduce pathogens. So typically, what we do with our nets and our equipment is that we'll either sterilize those between sites using boiling water or using vircon, which is a, a it's a chemical that's been approved. Uh, particularly for invasive snail species. So we just soak all of our stuff in that vircon for about 15 minutes and then rinse it out before we before we use it. If we know we're not going to use something for a long time, we can also rinse it out, make it look clean, and then just set it out in the sun and bake. Uh, but we prefer we prefer to either cook it or or poison it with vircon. And we'll do that with our shoes as well. Okay, nice. That makes sense. <clears throat> so our next question. When you interact with an animal with an extremely slow metabolism, does it have an appreciable impact on its energy reserves? You know, I don't really know the answer to that question. Kind of anecdotally, you can observe that if you hold some of these animals in your hand, just the heat from your hand, they'll, they'll start to be agitated and, and move and speed up. Um, most of our interactions with invertebrates, uh, 
don't end well for the invertebrates. Uh, most of our collections, we preserve that animal so, so it doesn't have a long life expectancy after we find it. Um, so, so most of what we're doing is not um, really working with the animals directly. Now, in cases where you're doing like biologic surveys, so you're not collecting and killing the animals, but you're just counting them in the stream, I wouldn't expect for the aquatic animals that our presence is going to have a lot of um, a lot of impact because we're not really changing the water temperature right, right by being there. Our lights aren't really changing the water temperature. If you flip a rock over, that animal is going to move. Um, but there's been some ecological studies to show that you know they move anyway. They a lot of the interactions between animals that are already li living in a stream, for example, is avoidance. If one animal finds another animal, it's just going to, they're just going to like go, go their separate ways. They're not going to duke it out fighting. So they're used to moving around, right? If, um, if I saw one of those big proteus sitting around, I wouldn't poke that proteus, but the proteus isn't on such a tight budget that, um, that it's going to starve if you, if you touch it. Uh, now, that's different than bats, right? Uh, so that's the big thing with white nose syndrome is that bats are on such a tight energy budget, budget when they're hibernating that white nose syndrome, this fungus that affects them, wakes them up, they're not able to feed, and they, um, and they starve to death. But their metabolism is a lot higher, right? So their heart rate speeds way up when they wake up. And I don't think you would, I wouldn't predict that you see that same kind of physiologic response uh, when you're messing with some of these aquatic invertebrates. Okay, great. And before I go on to the next question, I just want to point out that uh, Jeremy Hall, Travis County, put some links in the chat for everybody uh, so you can access our uh, story map, Balconies Canyonlands Preserve story map, events calendar, and an interactive map of the BCP. You check out those links. And then next question are there any citizen science projects that deal with groundwater fauna that folks can get involved with? Yeah, you know, there aren't any that I'm aware of. We have played with the idea of involving master naturalists or, or other interested citizens in, um, in helping to sort and process our samples. We haven't done that yet. One thing uh, that citizens can do that is really useful is to to report potential groundwater habitats. So if folks know of, of caves that go down to water, uh, those can be reported to the Texas Speleologic Survey. Or if you observe springs, right, there are some Facebook groups where folks can report the presence of springs. And so knowing where potential habitat is, is a great way uh, that, that citizens could contribute to the science. Okay, great. Um, okay, and so next question, I know that some salamander species are, are you know, only found in one or two places. Uh, are some of the species that you were meant, talking about earlier, uh, how wide range are their distributions? Um, do they have wider ranges than some of the salamander species? Uh, I love that question. I could have given a whole talk just on that. Uh, no, most of these species are also extremely small range endemics. And I can't, I wish I could remember the number for you, but uh, many of our species are single site endemics, uh, or if they're known from more than one site, it's still an extremely small uh, range. And so most of these species, uh, well over half of them, when we rank their conservation status, they come out as critically imperiled because their range is so small. Uh, very few of them are known from many sites. And in fact, the few species that are known from a lot of sites and have a big range, with a few exceptions, many of those are probably actually species complexes. So multiple species that we just call the same thing right now because we haven't looked at them closely enough. But now it's the same pattern that you see in, in salamanders. Okay, all right, interesting. And then we've got another question. Um, do bats or birds live in some of these systems and do they impact the groundwater fauna in some sort of way, i.e. add nutrients, et cetera? Yeah, so, so bats, for sure, um, can be an important source of nutrients for some aquatic systems, right? If, if there's a bat roost over the water, right, that guano can come in and, and be a really important source. Um, guano communities are really important terrestrial communities as well. So not aquatics, but especially in the tropics, if we, if we look at the guano communities, there can be lots of species that are living on, on guano. Uh, 
there's an interesting kind of anecdotally, we can, if we look at Ezel's cave, which is an important biologic cave here in San Marcos, historically there were bats in that cave and those bats were extirpated a long time ago, um, basically because of, of poor management of the, of the entrance. And so now there aren't bats that live there. And anecdotally, folks will tell you that back when there were bats, you would see a lot more salamanders and aquatic invertebrates in that pool, probably coming up from deeper in the aquifer to utilize that guano resource. And that now that the bats are gone, we don't see as many animals in there. Um, there are also some, uh, some salamanders and stuff that have been reported to feed on, on guano as well. So yeah, bats for sure can be really important uh, in some of these sites. It just depends on where you are. Parts of the Edwards aquifer uh, aren't really opened. They're it's what we call a confined zone. So there are actually other layers of rock over top of the aquifer. Um, so it's not exactly, it's not, you know, closely connected to the surface. And so you don't get input from bats in those kind of systems, but in some for sure. Yeah. All right. Interesting. I didn't know that about some sal salamanders feeding on guano. That's, that's pretty cool. All right. And then we have a couple more minutes. And last question. Could you talk a little bit more about the Mexican blind cat and some of their physiological adaptations or how it's discovered? Boy, so uh, full disclosure, I was uh, not part of the group that found the Mexican blind cat. And, and I don't know a ton about it. I know. So it was found uh, down near um, Lake Amistad. And it was found by uh, a really sharp a naturalist down there who was in a cave and observed uh, what he believed to be a blind catfish. Uh, that spotting initiated um, uh, several years of sampling. Uh, the San Antonio Zoo was heavily involved in that. Uh, and that sampling, uh, trapping for the fish, eventually found it in that cave, confirmed that it was a Mexican blind cat. And I think since then they may have found it in, in another cave down near Lake Amistad. It was speculated that it could possibly be here for a long time because there are some populations in northern Mexico that were, you know, kind of close. Uh, I don't really know any kind of specific uh, adaptations uh, specific to the Mexican blind cat. Uh, those catfish in, in general, you know, I think we assume that the Mexican blind cat is a predator of, of groundwater invertebrates, and we have found other groundwater invertebrates in those caves. Um, because they don't have eyes, you know, most fish or subterranean fish will have well-developed or extra-developed lateral lines. Um, you know, those, those barbs are, are a good pre-adaptation. So catfish are one of the more common types of fish that work their way into um, groundwater systems because they can smell and detect food really good. Um, that's about all I could, uh, all about all I know about the, the blind cat. All right. Well, that's great. Great. Um, that was a really good presentation. I think that's all the questions we've got for now. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate your time and really good wealth of information we got. So. Great. Thanks, y'all. All right. Thank you so much.